an ensemble cast with superpowers, musical sequences, and an old man in the middle of it all. Yep, we're talking about season three of Umbrella Academy, one of our favorite shows. But sadly, this season's finale left us with some questions that are difficult to ignore. From major plot points to trivial issues, in this video, we're discussing some of the most burning questions we have. First up, where's all the money coming from? Remember when the Hargreaves arrived at the Hotel Obsidian? They're literally rummaging around in their pockets trying to rust up some cash to pay for their lodgings. When everyone turns up empty, Luther eventually offers a seemingly expensive watch in order to pay for two rooms. The scene tells us that the Umbrella Academy isn't exactly rolling around in riches, but then a number of things happen. Allison takes a taxi to go home and come back. That's a round trip, girl. Five gets a brand new custom suit, Victor goes to get his long locks chopped off, and then there's an endless supply of alcohol back at the Obsidian. Guess what? All of these things cost money. While this may have been not so significant for other shows, the Hargreaves just established in a scene prior to all these instances that they don't have money. Zero. Zilch. Nada. Is Allison abusing her powers in scenes we don't see? Is Victor threatening people? None of this explains how and where the purchase money is coming from, especially for the custom suit. We need answers. Next, who's Jennifer? The Umbrella Academy has always been vague regarding the the details of original Ben's death. Up until now, we know that he died as a teen, on a mission that practically separated the Umbrella Academy members. But we finally get a name in Season 3, and it's the Jennifer Incident. We hear both Luther and Klaus mention it, so you best believe that the writers wanted us to know, but then gave us no follow-up details. It's just a name at this point. Could be any name. Martha, Elizabeth, Marianne. In Episode 7, when Victor is hiding out in Sparrow Ben's room, he finds a bunch of sketches of a woman, and they've all the name Jennifer written everywhere. So basically, Jennifer is important in both timelines. Did Umbrella Ben try to save her? We'll know more about Jennifer in Season 4. Jennifer, you need to reveal yourself because patience is not one of our strong suits. And now, where's Stan? The last time we saw Stan, he was revealed to be the son of Lila's friend, Trudy, instead of Lila herself, and she just borrowed him to test whether Diego was ready to be a father or not. Just your normal everyday way of telling your partner you're pregnant. No big deal. We've all done it, right? Well, in all of this, poor Stan got sucked in by the Kugel Blitz, but with the resetting of the universe, one would believe the kid with the weird ear would be okay. But where is he? A visual of Stan, maybe as an adult, would have been so great to see. So whether or not we see him in season four is a mystery right now. Up next, how are Ben and Diego multilingual? Episode eight features a scene where Ben and Diego are having having this really intense argument, and both of them slip into Korean and Spanish respectively. The language shift was actually an improv situation by actors Justin H. Min and David Castaneda. While it was a great idea to keep the scene and include it in the final cut, we do have one question. Um, how do Ben and Diego know how to speak Korean and Spanish? Considering that Reginald is known to be this hard, cold man who didn't even name the kids, it's kind of hard to believe that he'd take out the time and make the effort to educate the two with respect to their cultural backgrounds. Maybe their manipulative and murderous father actually has a conscience and is more considerate than we thought. This is one question we're willing to let go of, as long as we get more scenes with Ben and Diego harping at each other in Korean and Spanish. Even a single line of dialogue would do. And now, what's up with Luther's moon rock? We all know Luther spent four years on the moon, alone and isolated in his original timeline before season one even began. We've heard him say it every single single season. We get it, buddy. When he proposed to Sloan in season three, he did it with the moon rock, which leads us to this question. Was he carrying a piece of the moon with him this entire time? During those time travel scenes in season one and the 60s adventures in season two, was the moon rock just casually chilling in his pocket? Sure, it's very plausible that he just popped it in his wallet and just kept carrying it around, but why? He clearly hated his time on the moon, so would he constantly want to be reminded of that sad and lonely four your stint? Yeah, okay, we may be reading too much into this, but the moon rock only seemed to serve a purpose after three seasons for the little cute moon rock ring proposal scene, but to the writers, we just want to know why. Now, what's the point of Klaus getting a superpower upgrade? In the absence of Ghost Ben, Klaus is now seen spending much of season three polishing his powers, thanks to Reginald. By getting killed multiple times in traffic and not one of the drivers stopping to see if he's okay, Klaus eventually gets rid of the spirits that have 
always seem to terrorize him. A nice bit of personal growth. We love to see it. But over the years, we've seen that Reginald only does what benefits Reginald. So what benefits does he get by helping Klaus be better at his own superpowers? Since Klaus is the only one who can see and talk to ghosts, banishing them only helps Klaus himself. So what is Reggie up to here? Maybe it was to pique his scientific curiosity. Or maybe it was to make sure Klaus trusts him again, only to betray him near the end of the season. Either way, Reginald's supposed motivations seem weak in comparison. Next, is Five really the founder of the Commission? Five and Lila decided to stop by the Commission, which, by the way, is looking real destroyed and desolate, to look for answers about the Grandfather Paradox. They go on to find a book of protocols that tells them that the founder needs to be the head of the operations bunker for safety reasons, in case of a Grandfather Paradox. Five and Lila head off to the bunker, and sure enough, the founder is there, being kept alive in some sort of hyperbaric chamber, and also happens to be a 100-something-year-old version of, wait for it, Five himself. He lives long enough to reveal an amputated arm and gives Five a cryptic message to not save the world, while offering no explanation on how, when, or why he founded the commission. Rude, maybe with the new universe reset, Five isn't the founder, but we hope this is addressed in great detail in the next season. Don't leave us hanging, guys! And now, who named the Sparrow Kids? In the original Umbrella Academy timeline, we know that Reginald never bothered to name the Hargreaves children, and they were given their names by Grace, the robot mother that he created in order to take care of them. In comparison, Robot Grace at the Sparrow Academy is more robotic, not really matriarchal, and obviously seen as an annoyance instead of a caregiver. So how did the Sparrows end up getting their names? Maybe their version of Reginald is softer than what the poor Hargreaves got, and Reginald actually saw them as people and not experiments. Interestingly, Ben is still named Ben in both the timelines, so does that mean there's some sort of shared source in the naming of both sets of kids? We have many wild speculations at this point, and guess we're just sticking to those for now. Up next, why was Allison in the deal? This season, we think Allison was running her own contest called The Worst Sibling Ever, and clearly winning it. So it wasn't very surprising when Reginald came to her to strike a deal. Allison agreed to stab her siblings in the back, figuratively. For Allison, the deal was obviously a no-brainer. Reginald probably told her he could reunite her with daughter Claire and husband Ray, a temptation too strong for Allison to ignore, considering the roots of all her anger and sadness stemmed from not being with them. It's clear that Allison needed Reginald, but we're confused by what Reginald needed from Allison. His plan to reset the universe could have easily been done without her. In fact, it might have been better without her, since she ends up hitting his head at a climactic point. And finally, will we ever stop watching that footloose dance sequence? Okay, so we have an answer for this one, and it's a resounding no! That's a wrap for this video. Do you have any more questions about the season finale we might have missed? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one.